Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming along to the, uh, the sauna. It's uh, kind of warm. Um, so if you fall asleep, I shan't be offended. I'll put it down to the heat uh, and nothing else. So I work at Confluent. Um, that's Confluent, not Confluence. This always causes confusion. Uh, Confluent are one of the companies who contribute to the open source Apache Kafka project. And we also have Confluent Platform, which is a, a distribution of Kafka. So quick show of hands. Who's using Kafka today? Almost everyone. Who's not using Kafka today? That's really interesting. We kind of like the, the balance has now shifted. Um, who's using Kafka Connect? Who kind of thinks they maybe should be, and that's why they're here, but they're not using it yet? OK, and who's here because it's like somewhere warm to hang out? So Kafka Connect is part of Apache Kafka. Um, and it gives you a way to integrate other systems into Kafka and from Kafka to other systems. So you can use Kafka Connect to pull in data from a database, from a message queue, from a flat file, from anywhere where you want to, and stream it into Kafka. And you can use Kafka Connect to stream data from Kafka down to somewhere else. Stream data from Kafka to Elasticsearch, to Mongo, to Influx, to a database, to wherever you want to put it. And the thing about Kafka Connect is it lets you build these end-to-end -end integrations without needing to write any code. So we're all engineers or software developers or techies of some various form, and we all love to write things and build things from scratch. And as much fun as it is to reinvent the wheel each time and kind of build our own frameworks to do these things, Kafka Connect solves this common problem that people have of, I've got data here, and I want to get it to there, and then I've got data there, and I want to also get it over there. Because Kafka Connect just gives you a configuration file. So as a, as a data engineer, as we all are nowadays, you just set up a bit of JSON. You say, I want to connect to this system. I want to pull in this information and stream it into this particular Kafka topic. And it's kind of as easy as that. Or it's mostly as easy as that. That's why we've got another 37 minutes to talk about it. So people use Kafka Connect for different things. People use it for just very simple, fairly dumb pipelines. We're going to offload some data from here, and we're going to go and put it over there. We've got data in our transactional system over here. We want to go and stick it in a bucket over there. Or because Kafka persists data, they say, well, we're going to take the data from here. We're going to put it over there. But we're also going to put it over here. Because that's the great thing about Kafka being this distributed, persisted commit log. You can reuse your data. You bring the data in once, and they say, well, we'd like to put it over here for this use case. We'd like to put it over there for that use case. And we'll put it over here as well for something else. And you can use Kafka Connect to take the same data and put it in different places to suit your purpose. You can also use Kafka Connect to simply say, well, my application is generating data. I'm using Kafka as a broker between my services. But some of that data, I want to write out somewhere. So option one is we build that into our service. We write ourselves a service that does all this kind of stuff. And we say, well, we'll connect to the data store. And we'll worry about if the network's down, or how often do we retry, and where do we store the credentials. And we'll worry about that, because that's a sensible thing to try and build into a service. Or we say, well, we're generating data. We're writing it to Kafka anyway. We want to get that data down somewhere else. We'll decouple that responsibility. So our application, our services, our service thing, which is what it should be doing. And then Kafka Connect is responsible for saying, data in this topic, we'd like to go and also put it over there. We'd like to monitor what's going on between our services. We'd like to put an audit of the data in those topics, copy that to Elasticsearch, or stream those metrics to Influx, and so on. But you can also use Kafka Connect as a way of starting to migrate your architectures away from a, an older way of doing things, maybe built around kind of like a, a monolith with a database sat underneath it, and move it more towards an event-driven way of doing things without having to actually just tear everything up and start all over again. So you can say, well, we've got our existing application. It's writing to the database, the database, which is this lovely thing that we've loved and cherished for so long. And we can't get rid of that. We can't rewrite that application just for the sake of wanting to move to a different way of doing things. What we can do is we can take the events out of the database, stream those into Kafka, and use them to drive new applications that we're building. So without impacting the existing application, we start to migrate to a more flexible way of doing things by taking those events out of the database, using transaction logs and change data capture, all that kind of good stuff. So we're not impacting the database. It's very low impact, very low latency. And we can now drive new services, new applications with those events. So there's different reasons why people use Kafka Connect. So I want to show you Kafka Connect in action. And I honestly really do want to. But whether I can or not is up to my laptop. 
So I've done this demo before and it really did crash and burn. I've set it running now and we'll see if it's actually going to behave. So cross your fingers. So first off, we've got Kafka Connect and it looks like it's running. All this code's on GitHub, by the way, if you want to try it out for yourselves. And what I'm going to do is simply take data from a database, stream it into Kafka, and then take that data from Kafka and stream it down to a couple of other places. And the points here are it's very easy to do. It's just a few JSON files to say, get the data from here, take the data from there, and put it over there. And it's also streaming. This is event driven. This is not kind of, I'm going to wait for a while and then kind of collect a batch, and then like, maybe tonight I'll send it over there, and then tomorrow we'll do some processing. As stuff changes in the database, we're going to stream it into Kafka, and we're going to stream it over to other places where we might want to use it. So to start off with, we're in MySQL. It's just a relational database. It could be any relational database. And we've got some data in it. It's information about some orders that people have placed, who placed the order, what did they order, when did they place the order, and so on. And I'm going to set a data generator running. So we set that running. And over in MySQL, if I re-query it, you'll see 1518 was the first record, 1526. So there's new data arriving. And what I'm going to do there is I'm going to set a new script running. And you can see from our cheat sheet what's going on. You can also use that cheat sheet to run this for yourselves. And we're going to run this, which is simply going to echo to the screen the data as it changes. So every couple of seconds, we get a new row coming in, which you can see from this create timestamp here. Now, we're going to get that data from the database and stream it into Kafka. And to do that, we're going to use Kafka Connect. So Kafka Connect, I'm going to talk about how it works and what connectors are and plugins and all this kind of stuff afterwards. But first, I'm just going to show it you. So to start with, we just configure it. We're going to post it a configuration on the REST API. Here's the connector that we're going to use. It's a connector from a project called Debezium, and it connects to MySQL. It uses the MySQL bin log, the transaction log, to get the events out, and it also snapshots what's already in the database. So we say, connect to the database over here. We're interested in this particular table, the orders table. So I'm going to copy and paste that over here. So that will run. And if I go and look at the Kafka Connect log, you'll see it will start churning away and it'll actually start firing up that connector. And you'll see it doing snapshots and all that kind of stuff. So if we go back over here, if I say to Kafka Connect, what is the status of that connector? It'll say, I've got a source. It's using the Bayesian connector. It's running. And so are all of its tasks, which is a really good thing, because it means we're getting data into Kafka. Or we think we're getting data into Kafka. If we go and check in MySQL, OK, here's my SQL. Here's the data being generated. Let's put that on that side of the screen. On this side of the screen, let's have a look at actually what's in Kafka. So I'm going to use the Kafka Avro console consumer to say, what's the data that's currently in that topic? And hopefully, any moment now, it will say the data in that topic is whatever's in the database. There we go. So we've got data in MySQL. I should probably put it the other way around. So we've got data in MySQL being generated, being written to by whatever application is writing to the database, streaming in real time into Kafka. So that's kind of useful, because we've now got Kafka, a topic in Kafka, which any application can hook up to and say, oh, anytime there's a new order, I would like to know about it, please. And the connector itself, it says, was it created? Was it updated? Was it deleted? It captures deletes as well. Deletes are also events. So you can integrate your database into Kafka using Kafka Connect. But you can also integrate Kafka into other places and push the data out, stream the data out. So one use here might be, I've got a service that wants to know about a new order that's been created. I'll use the Kafka Consumer or the Kafka Streams API to read that topic directly. But you might also say, any time there's a new order written, I want to analyze that. I want to visualize that. I want to put it somewhere else and use a tool appropriate for that. I want to go and put it into Elasticsearch. I want to go and put it into a graph database. So let's do that. So we're going to create ourselves a new connector. And again, all we see is here's a bit of JSON. The connector we're going to use is the Elasticsearch sync connector. You have sources and syncs, which are kind of obvious by the name. Send over to Elasticsearch anything that's in this topic. Here's my um, Elasticsearch host. So we copy that in and paste it. And then we're also going to stream it over to Neo4j. And again, here's the connector, Neo4j sync connector. And then bits of 
like connect a specific configuration. So here's the cipher information on how to handle a particular data itself. So we send those two connectors over to Kafka Connect. We say to Kafka Connect, tell me about your connectors, tell me about their status. It says I've got three connectors. I've got a sync from the, uh, sorry, a source from your database with Debezium, and I've got two syncs, and they're all running, which is splendid. Because what it means is we can then go and have a look at this data itself. So let's head over. We can use the uh, REST API, but I'm going to use Kibana because I like it. And we can also use the Neo4j browser. So it can be a race which one manages to load up first, with the fans on my laptop going at full pelt as well. But what's happening is the data is coming into the database. Debezium's reading the binary log, the transaction log, streaming it into a Kafka topic. Kafka Connect's taking that data, pushing it out both to Elasticsearch and to Neo4j. And the key thing here is you've got the Kafka topic and the Elasticsearch and Neo4j are completely independent. If one connector dies, the other one just carries on. And that data has persisted for as long as we've told it to. So when the connector recovers, it will just carry on processing from where it got to. So we can have a look over here. We've got data streaming in in real time. It's 1731 indeed. So the data is coming through live from the database into Kafka being pushed out to Elasticsearch. OK, you see that update there. It's updating every five seconds. The same thing with Neo. We can go and have a look at who bought some cars. Just show me the first 25 people who bought some cars. You've got these people here. We can start to drill into it. Who's that person? Where do they live? It says, well, that person hopefully lives somewhere. <coughs> they live in London. Who are the other people who live in London? And so on. So it depends what is it you want to do with the data as to where you'd put it. And this is the beautiful thing about using Kafka in your architectures. Because you can actually say, the data goes through Kafka, because that's a very sensible place to store events, because they're what drive our business. And then I want to do graph analysis. Great, I'll stream it to Neo. I also want to do search. I'll stream it to Elastic. I also want to do something else. I'll stick it to Influx or Snowflake or wherever I want that data. You don't have to say, well, I'll use this kind of one box here that kind of vaguely satisfies all of them but none of them particularly well. So with that demo done and actually succeeding, which is nice, let's understand a bit more about what Kafka Connect actually is. So Kafka Connect is built on this idea. It's a modular system. It's a modular framework. It's part of Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka is a distributed commit log. It's an event streaming platform. It has a producer and consumer API. It also has the Connect API. It also has the Streams API. These are parts of Apache Kafka. If you're using Apache Kafka, you already have Kafka Connect since version 0.1, I think. Oh, sorry, 0.10. So at its heart, it sits between a system where you've got data and Kafka, or Kafka and a system where you want to put data. If you're integrating with HGFS, with S3, with any system, and you're writing your own, Possibly you don't actually need to. Probably you really shouldn't be. Maybe you should, but most of the time not. Most of the time, Kafka connects what you should be using. So it has an idea of connectors. Connectors are the jar files, they're plugins that you can write yourself. It's just part of the Java API. But the beautiful thing about it is that probably someone already has. Someone's worked out, how do I interact with this database? How do I interact with that target place? How do I interact with it? And they've encoded that knowledge, that source or target specific information of connecting to it into a jar. So then you say, OK, Kafka Connect, use this particular plugin. And now Kafka Connect knows how to talk to x, y, or z. So it can pull the information in, and it will stream that through into the first bit of Kafka Connect. And all we have to do to configure it is say, well, use this particular connector. Connector class is this. And for a non-programmer like me, I'm not really, I write a dirty bit of Python, but not really. I'm mostly like a data engineer, what we call nowadays. Connector.class sounds a bit scary, but that's pretty much as scary as it gets. It's just JSON, and there's plenty of examples out there. So the connector knows how to connect to the source system or the target system. <clears throat> And it then passes internally. And this is all kind of like just under the covers. You don't actually see this when you're running it. It passes a connect record. It abstracts away the idea of actually it's a JDBC record, or it's a something from the bin log, or it's something from a CSV file. It abstracts it into, I've got some data, and I've also got a schema. And we'll see in a moment how important schemas are. So it passes that internally as a connect record, and it passes it to the converters. 
So Kafka Connect has connectors. Kafka Connect has converters. And they all begin with C, and it gets very confusing. But a converter is responsible for saying, here is this abstracted idea of some data plus a schema. I'm going to write that to Kafka in a certain way. Because your messages in Kafka, they're just bytes. Kafka doesn't care what it is. It's just bytes, which is really powerful, but it also means that as data engineers using this kind of thing, the onus is on us, the responsibility is on us to decide how are we going to serialize that data. And there's good ways and there's less good ways to serialize your data. So if you care about your data, if you care about your colleagues, if you don't hate your colleagues, you'll hopefully bear in mind that the schema that goes with data is pretty important. It's really important. My colleague Gwen Shapiro has this great expression, the, the schema is the API between your services. It's the contract between your services. And whether we're talking about offloading data from a database to put somewhere else for someone to use, or taking data from a message queue for someone to write a, a service against, the schema is massively important. And if you write a chunk of CSV onto a file server somewhere, you're basically sticking two fingers up to whoever's using it, saying, well, you figure it out. Or you're saying, well, anytime you want to use it, you come and ask me. And we all know how well that kind of coupling works out. So by caring about our schemas, by saying we're going to write our data in a format which supports schemas, then we're actually making it easier to use the data. We're making it easier to keep things more loosely coupled. So you can use Avro. You can use Protoboff. They're kind of like the two main contenders here. Avro is built into kind of um, Confluent Platform and elements of Kafka Connect, and it kind of makes it easier to use. There's a community converter for Protobuf. And this is the beautiful thing about it all being pluggable. So it ships with an Avro converter if you download Confluent Platform, but you can also go and download a Protobuf converter. But when you implement one of these pipelines, you say, I'm going to use this converter. I'm going to write my data in Avro. I'm going to write it in JSON. I'm feeling brave. I'm going to write it in CSV. It's up to you how you write it. Or if you're consuming it, you need to understand from the person who wrote to that topic, well, how have you serialized it? Is it JSON? Is it Avro? Is it CSV? I hate you. It's, kind of, it's, it's up to the people who are building these things. And obviously, it makes an awful lot of sense to standardize. So to standardize, I'm biased, but I would say standardize on Avro. It's very richly supported. It works very well. It lets you share your schemas. So for example, if you are using Avro, then the schema itself gets stored in a schema registry. So you get your data comes in. It's come from a database. It's come from a flat file. It's come from a message queue. It's got payload, and it's got a schema. So you could say, well, we'll put the whole thing onto a message. And now every single time I get a value, I'll store the value and the schema, and I'll put it on the Kafka queue. Eh, you could do, but it's kind of quite a big message. Avro takes a much more sensible approach. It says, here is your payload, and then the schema, we will attach that, the information about that schema, a reference to that schema into the payload, but then we write to Kafka in like a nice little binary form, but the schema itself gets stored up in the schema registry. So then when we come to use that data, whether it's Kafka Connect, whether it's KSQL, whether it's Kafka Streams, whether it's your own Kafka consuming application, regardless, it can deserialize that Avro data. It'll go up to the schema registry. It'll say, can I have the schema, please, for this particular ID? And then it can read, it can deserialize that data, and that data now has a full blown schema. Has anyone heard of KSQL? A few. KSQL is part of Confluent Platform. It lets you use SQL, streaming SQL over your data in Kafka. If you're using that, for example, you can simply say, do a SQL query against this topic, and you've got all of your columns and your data types defined. If you don't, you have to type them all in manually. It's that idea that schemas are so important to anywhere where you're working with the data. So anyway, enough about schemas. When you're building Kafka Connect connector, you specify the converter. Each converter has got its own parameters. So if you're using the Avro converter, you say, well, I need to tell it where to store the schema. The schema goes in the schema registry URL. If you're using JSON, you say, do I want to use schemas within the JSON, and so on and so on. So part of this is about understanding how to actually structure that configuration. So you've got the key and the value converter, because Kafka messages are key value pairs. And if you want, you can use different serialization methods for the key and for the value. So here, we're just going to use Avro for both, which is kind of quite a sensible place from which to start. So you've got the value converter, the key converter, and you've got the parameters for each of the two converters. So 
We've got connectors, which specify how to get the data in and out from the actual source and target systems. We've got converters, which are kind of generic, and we can plug in different ones to use. And then we've got transforms. So the transforms are an optional part of it, but let you do transformations on the data as it passes through. So you could say, as this data comes in, I would like to drop a certain field. As this data comes in, I would like to change the topic name to be something different. <coughs> Excuse me. As the data goes out, I would like to route it to a different index name based on timestamp, and so on and so on. So you can do light forms of transformation on it. It's not for building aggregates. It's not for doing highly complex joins and all kind of stuff like that. That's what you would use something like Kafka Streams or KSQL for. But doing these kind of light transformation pieces is really useful. The configuration is not entirely accessible, but it does make sense. So here's an example of, trans of two different transformations. One of them, we're going to add the date to the topic. One of them, we just can call label foobar, because we want to make it nice and difficult for people to understand actually what's going on. But the point is, when you create your transformations, you prefix it with transforms, and then you say, here are the two different transformations. One of them is add date to topic. One of them is label foobar. To make the point, these are just labels. So then when you actually configure them, transforms.label.configuration information. So this one here is using the timestamp router, which takes two different uh, parameters. This one here, we're going to drop a particular, or we're going to rename a particular field. So we're going to rename delivery address to shipping address. But this kind of light modification of data as it passes through is kind of useful. All of it is extensible. All of it. You can go and write your own. All of it's public Java APIs. You can write your own connectors. You can write your own transformations. You can write your own converters. And people do, and it's brilliant to see. You can also go and take advantage of what everyone else has written and download them. So Confluent Hub is one place to go and get them. A bunch of different converters, connectors, transformations, and so on. So a brief pause, and I'll have a cough, and then we'll carry on. Excuse me. So now deploying. So we've learned a bit about kind of what happens underneath the covers, just enough to understand what are all these configuration items that we're actually setting. Rather than just like, here's something I found on Stack Overflow, and I can like tweak it until it works, it's useful to understand what are converters. Particularly, converters are what trip most people up with Kafka Connect. And they're fantastically powerful when you understand what they're there for, but they're a real pain if you don't quite, and you're just kind of like fiddling until the damn thing works. So you've got your configuration, and it's working. Now you need to know how to actually go and deploy it. So Kafka Connect is built around this idea of tasks. And each task, sorry, built around connectors. And each connector is executed by a task. So we've got a connector that's taking data from a topic. It's streaming it down to S3. That work's actually carried out by an S3 task. We've got another connector. It's reading in data from a database using JDBC Sync. It's also got a task, or maybe two, because Kafka Connect can parallelize the work that it's performing, depending on the source or target system. If you're reading from a single flat file, parallelizing that probably isn't going to make much sense. If you're ingesting data from a database and you've got 10 different tables, parallelizing that makes a lot of sense until the DBA phones up and shouts at you. But Kafka Connect can do parallelism, and that's going to come down to the connector itself. So the person who wrote the connector will understand, does it make sense to parallelize this kind of ingest or egress? So the tasks are what carry that out, and the tasks themselves run within a worker. So the worker is responsible for actually giving the tasks a place to live and run. And the workers write the offsets. So Kafka Connect stores the offsets. And this is another of the many reasons why you should use Kafka Connect instead of being tempted to brew your own. Because you might say, oh, well, I've got this data here. I just need to go to HGFS. I'll write a Spark job, and that's fine. But then tomorrow, someone says, well, can you also write it to S3 and also to Neo? And you're like, well, that's three completely different technologies. I've hard-coded all of this to work with this one over here. So Kafka Connect abstracts all of that. It has uh, technology-specific connectors. It has generic things for converting. It also tracks where did it get to for each individual task. This one managed to write all of the data to Elasticsearch. This one, it fell over because Neo4j did something wrong and, or it broke or something. So this connector here has only got to this particular offset. When we bring it back up, this connector knows that, oh, fine, I'll carry on from there. So Kafka Connect does all of these good things. So it tracks the offsets. So you can run Kafka Connect in two different modes. Standalone, 
and distributed. And this, after converters, is probably the second thing which causes people the most confusion. Not always the problems, but just a bit of confusion. So standalone mode is just a standalone worker. It's just a JVM process that sits there and it runs. Whether you're running standalone or distributed, Kafka Connect does not run on your brokers. Nothing runs on your brokers except maybe Zookeeper. And even then, some people would argue. But Kafka Connect runs separately. It can run on a laptop, it can run on Kubernetes, it can run on wherever, but it does not run on your brokers. So it's a JVM process. You can run it standalone. But it's standalone. It's a single instance. It writes all of its offsets to a, a flat file. When you shut it down and bring it back up, it will read those offsets, and it will carry on doing that. Once you re reach the capacity of that JVM, so you're running three different tasks, and there's like tons of data coming through from the database and tons of data going back out. You kind of like hit saturation points. You can't scale it. Well, you kind of can. You can say, well, well, we'll just partition it. We'll now run two. One of them is going to run the S3 work. One of them is going to run the JDBC work. And that's fine until you saturate your JDBC one. And then you've got nowhere to go. Also, it's not fault tolerant. If that goes bang, it, you're hosed. You have to bring it back up. Nothing happens until you bring it back up. So the other way of running Kafka Connect is called distributed. And it's not as scary as it sounds. If you're new to distributed systems, if you're new to Kafka, a distributed worker sounds like, oh my god, I'll go for the standalone. That sounds much, much easier. But distributed is actually, in my opinion, a much better place to start. And this is why. You can run distributed on a single node. It doesn't have to be distributed. You can run it on a single node. But when you run Kafka Connect in distributed mode, it stores all of its configuration, all of the offsets, all of that kind of stuff in Kafka. Because Kafka persists data. Kafka is its permanent store of data. So Kafka Connect is using Kafka to store all of that good information, which means that if you then want to scale it out, you bring up a new worker, and that worker says, ah, I'm part of that same group. And it has all of its information, its offsets, its configuration, and so on, held centrally in Kafka. And Kafka is distributed and fault tolerant, et cetera, et cetera. So going from a single node of just like looking around like this is all good or whatever to, oh, we need to scale out, is a case of like, well, we'll bring up a new worker with the same group ID. So all of the learning of where do I find my log files, where is it storing the stuff, how do I configure it, what's the REST API, and so on, you do all of that once. Whereas if you go from standalone, and standalone you configure with a flat file over here or something, and you go from standalone to like, oh crap, we need more capacity or we need fault tolerance, now you need to relearn and kind of redo stuff. So there are reasons why people do use standalone. Maybe you need kind of like locality specific stuff, like you're reading from a particular local file, which wouldn't make sense to run like anywhere. There are reasons for standalone, but generally I say use distributed unless you've got a reason not to. So distributed gives you an easy way to scale. Distributed is also fault tolerant. So Kafka Connect is like the runtime for these tasks. Kafka Connect will say, well, oh no, we lost a worker. But we need to make sure that task keeps running. So it'll say, well, I'll bring it back over here. And obviously, if you don't have the capacity, it's going to keep on trying to run it. But at least it'll be running a little bit, maybe just kind of like a bit degraded. But at least it's running. You can also partition your distributed clusters. So you can say, well, I want to isolate these things entirely. Or maybe I've just got different teams run Kafka Connect. We don't have to have one great big hairy cluster of Kafka Connects. You can have one on this team, one on that team, three on that team. However you want to deploy it, it's up to you. But the key thing is Kafka Connect in distributed mode gives you that scalability and fault tolerance. So. I made Kafka Connect sound a bit scary by saying people have problems with this and people have problems with that. So I've gone through and I've thought, what are the things that people actually have problems with and what's the best way to learn to troubleshoot it? Because Kafka Connect is brilliant. Kafka Connect is super powerful, but it's got a few of these little speed bumps on the way that maybe trip people up and they kind of give up on it before actually giving it a fair chance. So for troubleshooting Kafka Connect, there's a few kind of like tips that I want to share with you. So as we talked about, connectors themselves run tasks, one or many tasks. And you can use the REST API of Kafka Connect to say, well, is it running or not? Which is kind of a fair question to ask. So you say, is the connector running? It says, yes, the connector's running. You think, brilliant, but where the hell is my data? And Kafka Connect says, well, <laughs> well the connector's running, but actually the task isn't, you see. And it's just one of these funny semantic things. So 
under the covers, each connector is executed by one or more tasks. If all of those tasks are failed, the connector can be running, but you ain't getting no data. So you have to go and check both. Assuming it says the task has failed, and you say, well, I don't know why it's failed, you can use the REST API to actually get a stack trace. Why did it fail? And you can kind of read it off there, and it's got all the kind of line breaks encoded within it, which is a bit hairy. At some point, you'll eventually want to go and look at the worker log. So as any good troubleshooter knows, the log's generally where you need to go and find out what's happening. It's not enough just to say, it broke. Where's my data? Go and have a look at the worker log. The Kafka Connect worker log is where all of the stuff gets written to. So depending on how you start Kafka Connect, depends on where you'll find it. If you're using Confluence ALI, it's Confluence Log, Doc Compose, Cat, whatever. It's written to standard out, and you can send it to different places. So the first thing is, you search through it, and you search for this, the first instance from the bottom of error. And it will say this, task is being killed and will not recover until manually restarted. At which point people say, ha, I found the error. What's this mean? Why is it broken? And a bit disappointed when we say, well, don't know. That's just the symptom. That just says Kafka Connect saying it broke. Doesn't tell you why. So you then go back up the log and search for the previous error, at which point you actually get the output from the task. And the task says, here's why I failed. Here's the stack trace. So you find the error. You find out why the task says it broke. Some of the common errors that we get. <coughs> this one, probably the most common one. Anyone seen this before? Yeah? A little nod, but no, too embarrassed to show your hand. So unknown magic byte sounds fun, but it's not. Unknown magic byte means that you've tried to deserialize some data using the Avro deserializer, but it's not Avro. Because you know I said that with Avro, it stores the schema, it stores information about that schema, like a little indicator to the schema in the scheme registry. So this magic byte, which is the fun little thing, that magic byte has information about what's the schema ID. And if you try and deserialize message which isn't Avro, there will be no little magic byte. It'll be like a curly brace or something like that, because it's JSON. So if you're trying to read JSON data, and you've said the converter is Avro, Kafka Connect will try and convert it from Avro. But it's JSON. So just use the correct converter. That's a quite an easy one. But then you say, well, it is Avro. I promise it's Avro. Look, here's my settings for the thing that's writing to it. And it could well be Avro, but either from you playing around when you're setting it up or someone else just playing silly buggers with you, someone's writing JSON data to the topic. Or maybe they started off writing JSON data and then they wrote Avro, but either way, you got kind of like mixed messages on the topic. So Kafka Connect will start from the beginning of the topic. If it hits a, a, a non-Avro one, you're going to get the same error. But the cool thing with Kafka Connect is it can handle errors. It's got dead letter queues. So in some instances, it can actually say, if I fail to deserialize a message, either I can kind of like just fall over and cry, or I can go and write it somewhere else and just carry on. And it's up to you when you're building that pipeline to say, well, what makes sense? If I hit a bad message, is that possible? Is that plausible? I'll just carry on or actually stop the world. There should never be any bad messages. We need to troubleshoot that and not continue. So the default behavior is fail fast, fall over, throw toys out the pram, complain. You could also say, well, the opposite. Screw it. We'll just ignore it. If we can't handle it, drop it, which is kind of brave. You can also say, well, be tolerant. Don't fall over. But if you hit a message that you can't deserialize, you can't handle, write it to a dead letter queue, which is a separate topic. And that means you can actually process it again. So in that example where you got mixed Avro and JSON, you can say, well, if you can't deserialize it as Avro, write it to another topic, read that topic with a JSON converter, and maybe you'll have better luck. Another common problem, no fields found using key and value schemas, or JSON with uh, schemas enabled requires schema and payload fields. What the hell do these mean? It's all about the schema. You remember the schema that I was getting quite passionate about before? Schemas matter. And when we're writing data down to a target system, that target system may or may not be kind of wanting a schema. If we're chucking data at Elasticsearch, we can say, well, kind of like, we'll just let it guess. And quite often, that's fine. If we're writing data to a relational database, the relational database is probably going to say, well, hey, I'm a relational database. I kind of schemas are what make the world go around. So if you try and write to a relational database or other systems without a schema, you're going to get an error. So if you're using JSON, sorry, if you're using Avro data, you're in luck because you've got a schema. That's the whole point of it. 
So you've got a schema which comes from the schema registry. You've got each individual message. Each individual message picks up its schema, and life is good. But if you've got JSON data that looks like that, so you've just got a bit of JSON, a lump of JSON, let's chuck it in a database, you might eyeball that and say, well, Oh, it's got a schema. It's got like an order ID, which looks like a number, and a make that looks like a string. That's got a schema. But you've not actually declared the schema. It doesn't have a schema. That's why it's saying, I don't have a schema. And you could argue that maybe the connector itself could infer it or whatever, whatever, but it doesn't. That's just how it works. So one option is you say, we're, we're going to use JSON, but we're going to embed the schema, in which case you must use that format of it. The other option is to use key SQL to take your source JSON, which kind of you can look at it and guess what the schema is, to take that and actually apply a schema to it and re-serialize it. And this is a really cool thing that you can do with key SQL. Every single message that applies on a topic, apply a schema, re-serialize it. Someone's mucking around with you, they're saying, here's a topic, it's got CSV on, ha ha ha. You say, well, I'll take that data that's here in CSV, I'll apply the schema, and I'll re-serialize it to Avro, and now everyone else can use it in a friendly way. So the same thing you can use with Kafka Connect. Finally, containers. So you can run Kafka Connect wherever you want to. You can run Kafka Connect in containers. I run it on Docker. Uh, it's a lot easier to use, like with Docker Compose and so on. There are two different Connect images uh, that Confluent pu publish. There's Kafka Connect Base, which is just the base Kafka Connect. And then there's Kafka Connect, which includes the Elasticsearch connector, the HGFS, uh, JDBC, and a couple of others. But when you're b uh, bringing other um, connectors in, other plugins in, you can get them from Confluent Hub. You can kind of like download it yourself and build it yourself, but you can get it from Confluent Hub pre-built. And you need to get that jar into your container. You could do it at runtime. So you can simply say, when I run, I'm going to first run Confluent Hub install and pull down the particular connector, and then spin up Kafka Connect and run that afterwards. Or you can build a new image. Whichever way you want to do it, it's up to you. Depends on where you want to store your data and so on. And you can also automate creating the connectors. So you can say, well, here's uh, Docker Compose. I'm going to install the particular um, connector. I'm going to wait for Kafka Connect to be up, and then I'm going to send it the particular configuration, the, the JDBC uh, configuration, which then means you can have just Docker Compose up, and it kind of like downloads it, runs it, configures the connector, and everything starts running. So that is all I have. I have two minutes to spare for a few questions. Um, that's my Twitter. Oops. So where's my Twitter? Ah, I'm off, it's my Twitter. Um, if you would like to tweet me, tell me if you liked it, tell me if you didn't. The slides uh, are on there. I will tweet them afterwards as well. But, oh, before I do questions, um, there are drinks downstairs. Um, I believe Confluence are kindly sponsoring. Um, so I'll hang around. I'll do a couple of questions now, but I'll be downstairs as well if anyone wants to chat. Thank you. And I'll do a quick speaker selfie as well. Other questions? There's one in the center. Let me come over. Thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah, would you use Kafka Connect to back up and restore compacted topics, or could you, should you? Uh, back up and restore Kafka uh, compacted. Uh, you can certainly write them, uh, sorry, read them. I don't see why not. So we can't, Kafka Connect can create the tar target topic, but you'd probably want to pre-create it with appropriate configuration. But I don't mm. see why that wouldn't work, no. OK, thank you. Any more questions? Um, is it free to use? Is it? Uh, I see that it's commu a Confluent community license. Yes. And not Apache 2.0. Um, so is it? So Kafka Connect is part of Apache Kafka, which mm. is Apache 2.0 licensed. Okay. The different connectors have varying licenses. So for example, the, um, uh, the JDBC connector, the Elasticsearch connector, uh, the HDFS connector, part of Confluent Platform, I believe they're Confluent Community License, but I would need to double check, I can't promise. Other connectors may be proprietary, others may be Apache 2. It kind of it depends on who wrote them. Thank you. 
hand it over right there. Uh, so our data producers produce JSON without Avro. So when I saw you present this uh, creating Avro schema by KSQL, mm -hmm. so it's uh, any or practice that how you co like how you relate. Um, correlate the, the, I'll say the KSQL to Kafka Connect because you use uh, KSQL to create Avro, but it's like isolated between Kafka Connect or it's somehow related to that. Yeah. L let me paraphrase and see if I've understood correctly. So you, you're interested in this idea of reserializing data using KSQL yeah. and how does it relate yeah. to Kafka Connect? Yeah. So KSQL is part Confluent Platform. It's runs also stand, executes as Kafka streams under the covers, but it's just a component that's reading data from a Kafka topic and writing data to a Kafka topic, just as any other application. It's just that it's using the Avro serializer, deserialized, or Avro serializer to write data that it's read as JSON. Is, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. I, I make it six o'clock, so go and get a beer if you want to. I'll hang around here. I'll be downstairs as well. All right, let's do it this way. Let's take the rest of the questions offline. This wraps up our last session for today. We, we hope you enjoyed the buzzwords. Uh, let's thank Robin again for, for the talk and Q&A. And uh, then let's meet downstairs for the get-together in the Pali. And okay. it's sponsored by Comfort. <laughs>